The WikiLeaks chief is an unlikely icon of modern day journalism. But in the last few months alone, has come to be feared by the world's most powerful countries and the rulers, especially the Americans, whose anger he cares little about. Now fighting a battle of his life in courts, aware that the Americans, whose inner secrets he's exposed, want to silence him, Julian Assange opens up to Times Now's editor-in-chief, Adnab Goswami. The setting for this rare meeting, his temporary home in Norfolk County, three and a half hours away from London. Mr. Rasanje, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Uh, you're an icon of journalism. Thank you. People look up to you. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but what WikiLeaks has been doing through the India Cables has been making a lot of news in India, especially over the last uh, 45 odd, odd days. Have you been following that? Yes, we have been following that. And um, we're, of course, extremely proud. I mean, this is what we all long for and hope for in our work, is to see this kind of effect. And perhaps we've seen similar level of effect uh, in the Middle East, but, but really the, the spectrum um, of material that has come out in India is exactly what we've hoped for. So far there's been 21 um, front pages uh, of the Hindu and of course uh, the material has played out uh, in many other ways uh, in the Indian media. Is it important to you that, uh, that these cables have an impact? Because you put out the cables in, in, in form, sort of the raw sense of it. There's uh, no interpretation to it. Do you look forward to a certain impact, for example, in the case of India? Well, what we promise our sources is that we will try to get the maximum possible political impact for what they're doing. You have to remember, people who are coming to us are sometimes coming to us with a great risk, um, with incarceration, persecution or, or execution. So we represent them like a lawyer represents a client to a court, we represent whistleblowers to the public. And what we're trying to do is make sure that the efforts that they go to have the biggest possible impact. And our activity is sort of geared and structured around that way, and that means making very specific um, deals with different media around the world, uh, promoting things ourselves, doing interviews like this one, uh, to try and raise the level, raise the credibility um, of the material that we get. Those who get hurt by the publication of your cables, read motives. For example, in the, in the context of India. The India cables primarily, which have come out so far, at least the first part of it, yes. was seen to be completely anti-American and also exposing members of the Indian political establishment who were too eager to please the Americans. Uh, can a motive be read there? What we do is provide people with the truth. Now, that, that is not our interpretation of the truth. It's very interesting. We are, we are in both an extremely difficult position in that we take information which has the maximum possible censorship on it. If you look at the reactions to us by the Pentagon, by the State Department, by the CIA, we have our own publicly declared CIA task force into us. Of course, it is difficult to publish this sort of information. On the other hand, we have structured things in such a way that we also have journalistically quite an easy job. That is, either the material we are publishing is a legitimate uh, government document or corporate document, uh, or it is not. What is inside the document in terms of its contents, what the State Department is saying about India, about other ambassadors, or what a, a banking organization is saying about its clients, that is an internal matter. The journalists then have to check over, crawl over, um, and, and the public itself to understand what that means for a country or what that, uh, the allegations mean. But for us, things are relatively easy. We just say, is this a true document? Is this a false document? And that's a black and white uh, decision for us. So we're, ab we're able to deal with this very hard case of publishing material that superpowers do not like, in part because the journalistic part um, of understanding um, is something true or false is very, very simple. Not every detail is known of this young Assange growing up years. As a child, he moved around a lot. 
and showed his irreverent streak very young. At 16, he formed a hackers group called the International Subversives. A name that to an American diplomat would have seen apt today. Now touching 40, Assange doesn't like being called a computer hacker. Something his critics like to describe him as for obvious reasons. Let me just step back a little bit, Mr. Assange. What did you set out to do when you started this whole journey? Uh, what, what really was the driving factor? Yeah. that you well, had? For, for, since the early 1990s, I've been involved uh, in publishing things that were difficult to publish. And I understood that bringing the internet to people, bringing information to people, educating people about how their wor world actually works, uh, is something that tends to make the world more just. And so, like many other individuals, I want to live in a nice place. Um, and when I see something around me that is unjust or inhumane, um, I feel that the world around me uh, is not a pleasant place for me to live in. So I wanted to take this um, things that I had done and, and learned from, um, some of my political understanding, technical understanding, uh, and the contacts uh, that I had made in human rights work, in cryptography, uh, in intelligence agencies, and journalism and pull them all together and solve what I saw as the biggest problem that I could solve, which was people not knowing how political and corporate institutions in a modern era actually behave. Because it, we need to understand how they actually behave if we are to deal with them. And in the end, it really is these institutions um, that control very large parts uh, of our life and, and the direction that human civilization is moving in. I see that there are three types of history and all our work as a civilization uh, is based on these three types. So one is information that has an economy behind it. So some of that is extremely important information such as how to pump water, how to create penicillin, very, very important human information. But there exists an existing industry around that. The other is information which people no longer care about. Um, books say that have published 100 years ago, perhaps information is important, but there's no industry around it. On the other hand, no one is trying to destroy that information either. And there's a third class of information, which is the information from within major institutions that people are actively trying to suppress from the public. That type of information is something that we've never really known before, that human civilizations have never really known. Going all the way back to ancient Greece, we've never really known that information because people have been working to keep it away from the public. And why do they work to keep it away from the public? Well, because they believe it will do something if the public knows. What will it do? Well, the public will take it and use it to reform those very institutions. And if we want accountable, just human institutions, then we need to understand in all the ways in which they are not being accountable, in which they are not being just. And once we have this understanding, then we can both address specifically individual acts of injustice, but we can also get a feeling for how they behave as a whole, for how systems of patronage work, systems of bureaucracy, international geopolitics. And I say, until we understand how these systems work, there cannot possibly be a political prescription or philosophical prescription into fixing those problems. So to that extent, all existing political philosophies are bankrupt because they are built on not understanding how human institutions actually behave in modern era. We have to first understand how our institutions are behaving before we can come up with programs to reform them all. Isn't the definition of what is just and unjust a very subjective thing? No, I don't think this is, no. subje I don't think this is subjective at all. I mean, w when we look at um, children around the world, um, 
playing with toys and one child is playing with a toy and another larger child comes and takes the toy away, well, there's a feeling within the child that that was unjust. Um, similarly, when people are arbit arbitrarily killed, um, there's a feeling this is unjust. Now, I say, and ev evidence shows, that in general around the world, that feeling about what is just and unjust actually is pretty common. It's only when we get to the more complex and ornate cases that people start to differ. And when we start to build up some kind of intellectual construct on these feelings of injustice. But the basic feelings of injustice that if one person is um, full and another person is starving and they're sitting side by side and that is unjust, um, that's something that is common amongst many, many people. When you, when you were 16, you started off uh, you know, with, the, with hacking and it was, uh, it was under the name of, uh, which meant nobly untruthful. Uh, why did you, can you just explain that? What you really meant by nobly untruthful? And you also, uh, there was a name which you gave to, uh, to your group, which was International Subversives. Well, now that just, sounds extremely dangerous. <laughs> well, we, we what were, were you setting out to do then? We, we were you know, teenagers trying to understand the world um, in, within, well, in an international context actually, uh, but especially from within Australia, which is sort of fairly isolated. This is pre-internet. Um, no, what we were trying to do is understand how these big systems worked um, and also um, challenge them, find things that were, that were, that were unjust. Um, and I ran a magazine uh, from that um, and we ended up being prosecuted um, as a result of that magazine. Um, uh, that took uh, six, six, year, six years uh, in court uh, to, to um, get out of that. Um, the uh, nobly untruthful, um, it, it's just a play. You know, if, if you use a, um, a pseudonym, well, yeah. it's not your real name, so it, it's um, just a sort of a clever play um, on the Latin words. Okay. I want to ask you a few questions in the context of India. I don't know how much you've been following what has been happening uh, in, in India, Mr. Assange, but we've had a series of scams. Now, every time, and people in India would like to know your views on this, Every time there is a scam in India, the government sort of steps in, or whoever is affected steps in and, and tackles that issue in what is seen to be a piecemeal way. It's more damage control. You know, handle one scam at a time, put it up to some process of inquiry, ensure that it is away from constant media attention. In your view, how long will this uh, sort of approach uh, last? I'm not sure. You know, when we started releasing these cables about India, yeah. we showed two things. One is what was actually in the material. So the various scandals that have come out, the relationship with the United States, the, the bribing in Parliament and so on. The other thing that we revealed was what the government reaction to all that was, what Prime Minister Singh's reaction to all that was, and other people. So we can see two types of information coming forth, and both of these are quite important to understand how these organisations are actually behaving. Um, so I agree with you, the response um, by the government left a lot to be desired. Now, I said before um, that it, it was clear to me that Prime Minister Singh was deliberately attempting to mislead the Indian people on what type of material this was. Um, people tell me that he is not personally corrupt, I do not know myself, I have no information on that as to whether he is or is not. Um, but his reaction left a lot to be desired. It wasn't to fully, frankly, investigate what was going on and then provide findings to the parliament. Rather, it was an attempt to spin the issue. And I suspect that that has come from uh, experience in dealing with similar scandals in the past. That is a way you can deal with them. You try and spin them, then you localise uh, an investigation and a response. If, if we are to have a strong response from the government, it will require a strong response from media. I mean, they just have to be pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed um, until they see that there is an advantage in performing a proper response. And that's what will drive these people. I mean, I understand from running an institution which is constantly under attack from state actors uh, and from critics, that 
you do try and put out the biggest fire first. Mm -hmm. So the absence of the Indian government to comprehensively respond does not necessarily mean um, that they will not or they have all sorts of vested interests in trying to shirk the issue. Um, a large part of it, no doubt, is that they have many fires to put out, like all big institutions, um, and so they simply put out the biggest fires that they can, and then they turn their consideration to the smaller ones. So if we want the Indian government to really address corruption, then it must become the central issue um, of the nation. So it cannot simply give these small um, concessions or small investigations or push, push something off uh, to a parliamentary committee. And that actually seems like it may be on the cards. Coming up, Assange tears further into the Indian government's response to the WikiLeaks disclosure and tells the story of how Hillary Clinton coached the Indian government's response. When asked by Arnab how sure he is, Assange looks totally confident. Hillary Clinton, members of the State Department, did in fact approach the um, Indian government in December. That story on the other side.